I'm Michael Boriskin, and I'm the Artistic and Executive Director at Copeland House. And I'm standing at Aaron Copeland's mailbox, which must mean that Aaron Copeland's longtime home is not far from here. Copeland wasn't just one of the 20th century's outstanding composers. He was among the most profoundly influential and beloved musical figures in American history and really helped to define an important part of the country's cultural identity. For the last 30 years of his life, he lived in an unassuming, comfortable home that really reflected his own modesty and practicality. We're less than an hour north of New York City, and we actually could be way, way out in the country. It is one of the things that Copeland so loved about this house. Uh, in an 80th birthday interview uh, he gave to the New York Times, he called this house my hideaway, my solitude, and it is uh, indeed a wonderfully serene and still bucolic a place to uh, both live and work. This was the command center of the house. It was really the focal point for Aaron Copeland. He said, you, I took one look at the studio at the far end of the house with a view of the Hudson River in the distance and felt immediately that this was a house that a composer could write music in. Uh, he was a celebrated man of the arts and really was the personification for most of the world of the American composer. Copeland House um, is involved in a wide variety of activities, continuing Copeland's legacy of championing American music. This simple work desk was made for Copeland by a local farmer. It so reflects uh, Copeland's practicality. No fancy, finely carved, ultra-finished desk for Aaron Copeland. This does the job. It's a wonderful workspace for him and was really, aside from his piano, perhaps the most important tool in this room and in his life. He spent countless, countless hours at this work desk. These objects hint at the breadth and renown of Copeland's career. The certificate from his National Medal of Arts conferred by President Reagan, a longhand journal entry about being one of the very first Kennedy Center honorees in the late 1970s, a New York Philharmonic commissioning contract, and work papers from his two operas and activities as an author, guest conductor, mentor, and recording artist. And now let's make our way through the rest of the house. This is another work area, and it's loaded with a lot of Aaron Copeland's personal library. He was a passionate reader, was very interested in literature and history, and there are all kinds of periodicals and books of all sorts, biographies, poetry. He loved poetry and chronicles and histories and so forth. This house is still very, very much an active living workspace, which is what it was originally designed as. These are scores from the almost 200 composers who have been in residence. Gifted American composers from all over the country and all over the world come here. They are invited for residencies. They are in retreat here where they can concentrate undisturbed on their creative activities and this is the result of, of their work. So as we continue moving through the corridor, we have here one of Copeland's most famous scores. It's the Fanfare for the Common Man. Fanfare for the Common Man has become almost a kind of national anthem. The wonderful thing that I've always loved about this score is that even if you don't read music, you look at it and you see all of the empty space on the page. There are so few notes here, and yet this piece is so successful in creating this kind of majestic feel 
um, to the music, uh, there's a kind of magic in the very few notes that are sprinkled on this first page. Copeland might have been about the most balanced of all famous artists and also had a wonderfully dry sense of humor. He carefully placed the Oscar he won for Best Original Score for the Heiress into this little warren of mirrors so it would look like he had a whole shelf full of Oscars. But in the barn where he previously lived, he apparently used the Oscar as a doorstop. The master bedroom is right next to the studio, so you can either fall into bed after working or jump right out to get started. And there's a tidy little guest room. We come to a surprise, which is the living end of the house. If the studio was the room where it happened, this was the room where one could come and leave everything behind, at least temporarily. It's a wonderfully relaxing place. He would start the day here. He would walk down the long driveway uh, to pick up the mail and come back here. He was a night owl and always spoke about the, the magic and the mystery of nighttime. Even when he was regarded as an international musical celebrity, always accessible to younger composers, to students, colleagues, scholars, interviewers. And most of the afternoons here were spent um, welcoming people who wanted to meet Copeland, to get his help, to interview him. And then he saved a lot of his creative work for the night hours. Our last stop is at the plaque that designates Copeland House a National Historic Landmark, which is the highest level of historic recognition in the U.S. This house is the only one of fewer than 2,500 landmark sites in the country that's directly associated with a concert music figure, and this plaque really sums up Copeland's seminal place in American music. It's a legacy that we try to honor and build upon every day, our music from Copeland House Ensemble tours widely and records on our own Copeland House Blend record label, among others. Our educational activities around the country are all about drawing out creativity in young people, and we're championing past, present, and future American composers through a wide variety of programs. Everything we do at Copeland House is animated by Copeland's professional benevolence, his personal warmth, and congeniality, and of course, his lifelong advocacy for American music. We think of this as your home for American music, and we hope to see you here soon.